Welcome to the Real Freedom Podcast, where we inspire you to pursue your passion to gain time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I'm your host, Mike Swenson. Let's get some real freedom together. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Real Freedom, talking about building wealth, gaining time and financial freedom through opportunities in real estate. I am your host, Mike Swenson, and today we are going to be talking about a lot of different things as it relates to multifamily real estate. And so our guest today we have is Venkat Avasarala, and he was electrical engineer and then pivoted to 14 years of corporate IT and then real estate. So we'll let you share current numbers of what you have right now, but you're investing in Dallas, Austin, Denver, and Phoenix, and you live in Dallas. Bought and sold a ton of units with a ton of value, but really what we want to make sure that you, the listener, learns is... How do I get started? How do I take those first few critical steps? Maybe I'm doing something in real estate and I'm looking to shift to doing more larger multifamily real estate. And so Venkat's going to be here to share with you those key steps so that you can get to the heights where he's at. You can get to the properties and the assets under management that he has. So thank you so much, Venkat, for coming on the show. We're so excited. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mike. Share with us a little bit about your initial journey here, getting into real estate how that happened, and we'll take it from there. So uh, I'm originally from India, uh, South India. Um, and then I came to United States uh, as a student back in 2002 to pursue my master's in electrical engineering uh, with the VLSA chip design. Uh, like it's pretty hot right now, not so hot back then. So couldn't land a uh, entry-level job here uh, in that, uh, because all those jobs went to South Asia at the time, Taiwan, China, and whatever. So I pivoted and then I went into IT. So ended up spending 14 years in corporate IT. Uh, four years into it, I quickly grew into the managerial position and senior leadership and all that. And then um, 2007 is when I, you know, they started laying off people and everything uh, because we are setting up to go into a big recession. We didn't know at the time. So mm -hmm. one day I was just going into my work and then I see emergency services. And then as I walked, towards the building, I started hearing loud cries and all that. I said, okay, something is definitely wrong. And then it was like 8.45-ish, 9-ish, and then people on the ground. This is a large MNC we're talking about, right? So turns out they were doing mass layoffs, right? And that really impressed on me. It's like, look, this can, this can happen to me, right? So what's happening there is they're outsourcing some 300 jobs on that particular day from US to Asia. And they're replacing these older uh, professionals who've been working on that same old stale technology, and they're not at the age where they can upskill and all that. And they're just replacing with some uh, some cheap labor from outside, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I'm not blam blaming anybody for doing it. Everybody got to do what they got to do to maximize their investors' uh, returns and to stay in business, right? It's just part of the game. But what dawned upon me is that these Folks, where would they go? Well, who will they hire on that old technologies that they've been working in IT, right? I mean, they're working on some mainframes. Now it's nobody uses mainframes, right? So then I told myself, yeah, I will let I will not let this happen to me and my family, right? I won't be this vulnerable. Um, and I was like uh, in my early 20s at that time. So it heavily impressed on me. So I went into single family at the time. Um, mostly I bought properties on MLS. Uh, some I rehabbed, some I already bought rehab because I had a very busy job, but I didn't use that as an excuse. I started building portfolio of single family homes around the rim of 635 in DFW, uh, where I can just get on 635. I can hit all my properties when I need to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so after 20... Um, Fannie Mae said that, yeah, no more loans for you. I can take private loans, but it was not very feasible uh, returns wise. So that is how I started with a simple goal that, look, if I get laid off, if my wife's get laid off, we still eat and we pay all our bills and doesn't have to drastically reduce our lifestyle. That was just a simple goal. And I was able to hit that goal in like about three to four years um, yeah. where I'm replacing my income with my passive income out of real estate. And real estate was very kind back then. The, the values, I mean, that that we were paying was nothing um, compared to what, what they're worth right now. And there was a very good cash flow. Taxes, insurance was very low. It was, it was a great time to own that. And then by 2015, I see quickly that it's becoming hard to operate these things. And then I put it to buying multifamily, a multifamily also known as apartments, apartment complexes, right? 
Um, so they cost uh, a lot and I didn't have the cash for it. So I went into the syndication route and till date I raised $152 million. I started slow. My very first raise was $1.2 million. It took about three weeks. So you hit it up on family, friends, and then referrals, and then you grow network and that kind of thing. Now we're advertised till now. Um, so yeah, I did uh, multifamily. I bought a bunch of properties, mostly in DFW, but uh, I have properties in DFW and Phoenix too. And then it has run its course. So basically everything was good until 2019. And then, so these are B and C class properties. These are workforce housing. So basically these are your people who makes 40 to $75,000 income people, right? Mm -hmm. The workforce of this country and had a ton of fun. And then in 2020, when uh, the pandemic rolled in, that is the demographic which got disproportionately impacted because they don't have a lot of money in the bank. They live paycheck to paycheck and they paid the price and I paid the price, right? But for being their landlord, right? So I quickly realized that, you know what, if I want to be successful in life and if I, if I want my investors to be successful in life, I need to figure out a way to cater to the affluent, the people who are doing well in life, right? Because their life, the people who have college degrees, high skill labor, influencers, right? So they're, they're doing really, really well and it's getting better by the year. So that is when I decided to exit that workforce housing. So sold about $350 million worth of uh, portfolio, about 3,500 units. And then I started building apartments. So now I'm building about 2,500 units, uh, mostly in D uh, DFW and Austin. Uh, these are class A affluent uh, neighborhoods and all that. And the plan is to build, lease up, stabilize and sell. And I do that with my investors, right? But I, I run the show, but I have a lot of investors backing me uh, do these deals. And soon I'll be going into uh, ownership of businesses, operational businesses. And I have my reasons for that. So it's a progression. What I try to do is to stay ahead of the curve. Don't want to overstay my welcome. Should know writing on the wall. You should realize when it's about to be over, the party's about to over and leave before the party's over, not after. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So that's in a nutshell has been my journey. Just kind of looking at this, you know, it's it's quite overwhelming to see all that you've accomplished. And so to remind people, things are going to change. The economy's changed, the market's changed, and you've adapted to that and, and done so well. And also reminding folks that it, this is also an evolution. Most folks start in single family properties. And so if you're looking at this thinking, okay, do I have to build and develop class A properties, luxury properties starting out? No, you don't have to do that. You can start in single family just like you did and work your way up. And I think for a lot of people, they get overwhelmed by successful stories of people that have you know thousands of units and hundreds of millions of dollars. But reminding, it started with one single family home. That's how you get started as one single family home whatever that might look like, or maybe you decide to start on the syndication side by putting your money into a syndication. But at the same time, that's that's how it starts. No, absolutely. Look, uh, it's really important that you have to start, right? Don't get into analysis paralysis and please don't compare yourself against you. You should compare yourself today versus yourself yesterday. That's the only comparison you have to be do. And make that 1% improvement, like as you go, right? And that 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 means that adds up to something significant down the line. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that, look, uh, everything that we want in our lives, right? Let's say housing, energy, uh, health insurance, uh, kids' education, everything is just growing uh, in, in price, right? I mean, that, that what you have to pay for them has been exponentially going up. You, our salaries are not keeping up with it. Right. So it behooves upon you to be an entrepreneur, have a side hustle, and maybe one day it will just replace your main uh, income and then uh, buys you financial independence and, uh, you know, financial freedom and uh, peace of mind. Right. So that you can provide for your family. You don't have to be stressed about the money because, look, half the half the divorces in this country happens due to the money. It's as simple as that. Right. So it's putting enormous strain on the people in this country where you, you just depend on job. Um, look, I'm not against job. I started with job. Look, my capital formed because of job. I'm so thankful for all my employers that they hired me and, and kept me for that long, allow me to uh, accumulate capital so that I can be an entrepreneur. This is not me bashing jobs at all. But I, I just, the only thing I insist is like, you, you won't know when you 
and that's going to go away. So talk a little bit about choosing these markets. You know, you you started with Dallas, obviously, because you're there and you're familiar with it, which I think is, is less in and of itself. For some people that always think the grass is greener on the other side, maybe just start with the market that you know well. But as you developed into the other markets that you're in, talk about kind of that thought progression and what made you decide those markets and maybe what dis- made you decide not to choose some other markets you were considering. Absolutely. See, um, you need people in anything, right? You want to run a retail business, an operational business, anything, you got to be where the people are, right? And Dallas is one of those rapidly growing cities. We have about, what, 7.8 million population. And it's not like I'll be around for the year 2100, but apparently Dallas is projected to be the most populous metro in the whole country uh, with some 33 million people. And we are at 7.8 right now, right? Um, And uh, that's one thing. And then we need because the route I chose was real estate, right? So what that means is I need to provide housing and that kind of thing. And I'm a landlord, right? So all landlords are not treated equally in all states. There are some states which are landlord friendly and some places they're not, right? And Texas is one of the very fiercely landlord friendly state. Uh, and, and then I live here, right? And then I live here. So all these three, it makes it slam dunk for me to start my business in DFW. And whatever I do, I try to do it in DFW because I, it's hard for me to find better market than DFW and Austin. Uh, I stay away from Houston. I have my reasons, mostly weather related, uh, but uh, Aust- uh, DFW and then Austin is a boom town. These are the two locations, Phoenix and Denver. Oh my God. Um, again, population growth, very low property taxes, and insurance over there. Um, And then proximity to California, people leaving California by hordes, they're finding their way into these metros. And Denver is like a nicer market, right? I mean, the high income market, even like I have a C-class property in Denver and for two bedroom, they pay like what, 1900 almost. And that is what I get for my class A property in Texas, in Dallas, right? So that just tells you, right? The trick is find people who are doing well in life who are comfortable, who have bank balance, and who who makes more money next year than this year. Find who those are and serve them. It's as simple as that, no matter what you do. Yeah, so how do you get into the design? So, you know, like you mentioned your background being B and C class properties, wanting to make that shift as a result of the, the last couple of years here. How do you work with developers? Because it is, it's a different type of property. It's a different type of market. And for some people, it's enough of a learning curve where they're like, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I want to stick with what I know well, but you embrace that, rolled up your sleeves and jumped in. So what did you have to learn about kind of the higher end A-class property market? One thing is for sure, change is eternal. Things will always change. We cannot control it. We just have to change for it. And we have to say on the right side of the change, right? Uh, like I was saying, right? Had I just stayed back with single family homes, they're negative cash flowing, right? Negative cash flowing. Like uh, their, their rent is lower than their PITI at the moment, right? And the, now that they're just hoping that one day it will appreciate, maybe it will, maybe it will not. I don't know. But mm-hmm. that's not the right way to build wealth. Again, the whole point is try to replace job and negative a negative cash flow is not going to pay bills. You have to pay that, right? Um, yep. So change is eternal. I, I embrace that philosophy. And tomorrow, let's say if sending rockets into the space is in fashion, it's attainable and achievable. Guess what? That is exactly what I'll be doing. I'll be competing against Elon Musk, right? That is the kind of mindset I have. Um, and, and I pivoted from my electrical engineering to ID. And I started with single family, I pivoted to multifamily ownership, workforce housing, and then I pivoted to ground up construction. And then I'm about to pivot again to owning uh, operational businesses. So I won't, as soon as you start one business, you'll you'll be a lot smarter. You know what a biz running business takes, you'll get exposed to tax, legal, legal legality, um, how the PNL, how to read a PL, how to project cash flows you will know all these things. Most of these skills are transferable. And now there is domain knowledge, which you absolutely know nothing about. So that is when you work with a mentor, right? So you you bring in a mentor or a very experienced partner. So for example, uh, there is no school teaching how to build apartments, right? I mean, there's no school. Early 2020, I decided, I saw the writing on the wall. I said that, look, I have to leave the workforce housing and I want to build apartments too. You say that, you can easily buy a class A property, but 
they, they cost pretty penny, right? They don't cash flow, right? They're so expensive. Usually insurance companies, pension funds, they own them. And I would say, you know what? I'm not going to compete with pension funds and try to buy class effort. I'm going to build them. But problem is I never built anything. Well, how do you solve that? So now you partner with somebody who has done it and, and do it all over again in his sleep, right? So I was able to find people uh, who have that experience and bring him into the bring them into the team. I still run the show, but you know I can actually borrow their experience, their contacts. I never buy anything on MLS when it comes to the sites because the only sites you can find on MLS and people's uh, mailing lists are something a uh, rejects, right? Basically, for the most part, I want Class A, right? I'm building in Frisco downtown. Frisco is like it's, there's no nicer place than Frisco in whole of DFW. I'm building in downtown. I'm not supposed to be in that, but the, I got in there because of my contacts that I have developed and enter into that old old boys club mm -hmm. and get those kind of things, right? So you need to find out a way to get into an industry, right? That is the key and uh, make it a win-win partnership. You don't have to keep all the dollar uh, that you make. Uh, you can, you know, 100% of a zero is zero. 50, 50 cents of a dollar is 50% of a dollar is 50 cents. I'd rather make mm -hmm. 50 cents uh, than 100% of zero. So that mm -hmm. is the kind of mindset. So basically by partnering and bringing people into the team. It's interesting you mentioned Frisco because the, the last time I was in Frisco was about two weeks before the COVID shutdowns. Um, oh. We were down visiting some friends of ours that moved from Minnesota. And so I remember seeing construction back in 2020 in Frisco. I would imagine it's grown a bit since then. Oh my God. Yeah, we've <laughs> got PGA here. Universal Studios are moving here. Yeah. Every single day there is news about Frisco Plano area, right? This is This is it. And yeah. I'm building three projects in north of DFW in Collin County, Denton County, which is like the cream of the cream of the crop uh, in comes to DFW. Now, you talked previously about you raising money with your contacts, money. right, with your, your group of people that you've got, your accredited investors. And so talk about the process of raising money from people, maybe even too for people that aren't looking to do a big development project like yourself, but maybe they are looking to raise money for a duplex or something smaller. What I've learned is, you know, there, there's a huge responsibility there to make sure you're providing great Super. investments. You have to take care of them for them to come back. Um, so talk a little bit about the, the, the raising capital side. No, absolutely. See, that's one skill, which is 100% transferable. No mm -hmm. matter what, where do you pivot in the future, right? I mean, everything needs capital. You can't do anything without capital unless you are like an influencer or whatever, right? So I started out by partnering with somebody, my very first property, right? I started with scratch. I mean, I have some single family and some of that skill set is transferable, right? Because it's the same sheet draw, carpet, the tenant, dealing with tenant lease and all that, right? So that skill is transferable. Um, but Single family, I did with my own money. I didn't raise uh, any money, mm -hmm. uh, but I was working, right? So I was living below my means and both me and my wife, right? So we, we saved like 50, 60% of our income. Um, but that is what I tell to the young people, right? Um, don't don't go chase all this luxury goods and all that. Just live like a pauper in the early stages of your life. Delayed gratification is the number one predictor of how well you're going to do in the future, right? So that is what I did with my money. And I did all my single families cash flow coming in. So I had some money to start with. But then again, I didn't have 1.2 million in cash to buy that $3.5 million property, my very first property, 100 unit property. So what I did is I partnered with somebody who has done three deals so far successfully. So you have to wet them. You cannot just partner willy-nilly with anybody. So capability is very important. Integrity is very important. Background is very important. So with you have to wet. It's a process, right? You keep the word out saying that, guys, this is what I'm trying to do and have crystal clear clarity on what your vision is. What is it that you want to do and what, where you need help with? That you have to articulate. And I used to share that with lenders, title companies, property managers, and all that. We don't know. I don't know who they know, right? But now they know that Venkat is looking for a person who will fill that gap. So I got an introduction that way. So uh, we hit it off. And then uh, I, I told them to look, I'll work for a third of a compensation, a third. You keep the two thirds, I will do 100% of the work, but you watch over me. I will prepare the deck. I'll do the pitching, but you will be there right by my side everywhere I go, correcting me on the on the way. So when I did approach it this way, and when I invited people to the webinar and sell them on the pitch, look, work the pleasure of working in IT, that is where, where we live in. Always the 
PowerPoint presentations and all that. So I brought over that soft skills, how to talk to people, conflict management, how to pitch, uh, all those skills from my IT career into this. Uh, and then I put together a presentation, answered people's questions, and I, I, I and do a ton of research. You should be knowing what you're doing, right? Otherwise, it's just uh, even not ethical to put people's money at risk, right? So gain knowledge, have somebody really experienced on your team, and hone in on your pitching skills. And um, people gave 1.2 million. That's the beauty of this country, right? I mean, the capital is readily available, and you cannot say this for most of the world. Right. So it, it was so easy. Right. We, we raised one point two million dollars. A lot of people kind of try to put the cart before the horses like, you know, how? Oh, yeah, I don't want I don't want to do anything unless I know I have the cash. So, you no, know, it, it's never works like that. No, no. First, find the opportunity that everybody would want to be in it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obsess over that and money will come. Of course, you have to work for it, but it will come. Now, kind of a, a nitpicking here going into the detail of raising the capital. Out of curiosity, where do these folks have their money currently before they decided to invest in real estate? Are these people that maybe invested in other real estate projects or they've never invested in real estate before and you've got to share with them the value of investing in real estate? Absolutely. Most of my investors actually park there. <laughs> Look, I'm from IT, right? So most of the people who gave me money are in IT background. That's usually the case, right? I mean, because mm -hmm. they are the ones who can better relate with me than anybody else, right? Exactly. I do have doctors. I have. I do have business owners. I do have retirees. Uh, but I would say overwhelming majority, like 60, 65% of my network is our IT people. Now, ID pays really well, and but the thing is, that won't leave any time to do anything else, right? I myself was a victim, right? Before I got started with investing, I used to go to my 401k, and when it's time to allocate my money to, to different funds, I used to sort on the, okay, which funds performed the best last year? And I picked the top three or four, 25%, 25 25 and that's it. Okay, I'm done. It's mm -hmm. like, we don't want to waste our brain power on picking investments and all that, but we rather spend all that time on, on job, right? Doing complicated stuff. It's fatigue when it comes to our own personal finance. And, and I know that, I mean, because I was one of them, right? So that is what people were doing. They had some 401ks, they park money in the cash. Some, some people dabble with the stocks as, and they give up as soon as they lose some money because stocks is a whole different world. I mean, it's not for everybody, right? Um, so these are the different conditions and they are just, they don't have any more cash flow. They don't have any way other to build unless they work. There's no other way they're making money, right? So I talked to them and said that, look, this won't work. One day that job might go away, right? Now they're talking about AI, automation, outsourcing, and you don't know what the future brings, but you don't want to be so vulnerable. So you need to have this additional way of making money, either cash flow or appreciation or whatever, other than your single family home, mm -hmm. right? So that is how I pitched to these people. And then uh, I was, I was it's, it's very straightforward, right? I mean, I don't need to convince uh, people a lot. Now, risk is very important. You have to clearly articulate. There's nothing without risk. And now you, without risk, you can um, give uh, money to Uncle Sam and make about 5% yield. But this is as high as it's going to get, right? Because it's not going to be like that forever. Once they increase the roads, it'll go back to near zero again, right? But inflation is 3% and that, that's where I'm going to cut it. So you need to make 15, 20%, 25%. You don't need to double your money every six months or a year, but something like with the 20% clip, if you can consistently do that, you'll do really well. In life. So that is, that is the vision I have shared with my investors and it resonated very well with them. Then obviously the next step is you have to produce what you say you're going to produce. Once you've done that, it lends itself well to say, okay, this project's done. Here's yeah. the next project. You know, they talk about how much harder it is to find a new customer versus retaining an existing customer. You now have a customer investing in your deal. The best thing you can do is have that deal do well. And yes. then you've got them for the next one and the next one and the next one. Yeah, I mean, basically it's a it's couple of things, right? Obviously the operational excellence has to be there. So you need to walk the talk. And the second thing is how you treat their investors, right? You, you don't have to treat them like kings and queens, but you just treat them how you would like to be treated by others. It's as simple as that. So what that means is transparency, right? Pe a very periodic updates and share both good, bad, and the ugly. Don't keep 
people in the dark and just throw all the dumb the bad news at one time. Um, so because it happens quite often, right? Like where the sponsor cannot pull himself or herself to share bad news and they try to delay, 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 delay. And then once they let it go and people are like, what? I thought everything was going well. What, what is happening? I mean, they probably will never invest with you, right? Most mm -hmm. people here are understanding, right? Like look at this interest rates. I mean, who would have predicted that they would raise interest rates that fast and that high, right? So people would understand, but you have to share that from uh, both your wins and losses on a day, uh, at least on a monthly basis, if not daily, right? So that has to be done. Now, when it comes to the operation excellence, right? Remember how I said that you need to partner with somebody who have done it several times before? Mm -hmm. That's one aspect of it. And the second thing is having curiosity and absolutely obsessing over knowing anything and everything in the domain. You need to have a mindset that there cannot be anything. I know I won't get there in first week or first month or even a first year, but I would say in a couple of years, you need to know everything about the domain, everything. You should be able to talk things very intelligently at length with anybody in that domain. Let's say multifamily, right? You need to know everything. Um, so once you have that knowledge, once you, once you are just consuming knowledge and getting obsessed with it until you get there, it helps you make right decisions. It's not rocket science. We're not sending rockets into space here. This is just managing apartments, single family homes, building stuff and all that, right? So, but without knowledge, everything looks like daunting, right? So that is what I would say. Be very curious, obsess over getting knowledge, talk to people, read stuff, pay mentor if you have to, if there is a mentor available in a certain thing. You know what? You're buying their 20, 30 years of wisdom for a fee. I wish there is a mentor for everything in life, you know? It's like mm -hmm. you just gain 30 years of life right. right so that is that is how i think and and i spend money quite a bit on i don't spend a whole lot of money on marketing maybe i should but i spend a lot of money in learning if somebody wants to teach me something i want i want to pay you. okay when can i learn have you ever heard the phrase you're the average of the top five people that you hang around well real estate agents i'm excited to increase your five with you we're launching the Real Freedom Investor Agent Tribe to help you get educated and connect with others to build your real estate investing journey and also to help you along the way as you're working with real estate investors. So come check it out on our website, realfreedom.com. Go to the store. We have a membership. We have a mastermind group and private coaching to help you stay accountable to your real estate investing goals and to make sure that you connect with like-minded people to accelerate your progress and to cheer you on along the way. Check it out, realfreedom.com. Click on the store. There's so much good stuff here that you shared. I, I've got a full page of notes as I love to take notes when when you, you're talking. So for people that want to reach out to you and learn more because we're at our time here, how can they do that? Well, they can go to my website. Um, I do have some newsletter if you want to stay in the know on mm -hmm. I'll talk about economy, what's working, what's not. Again, the idea is to share those kind of things, actionable things, insights, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right, because they don't say this on you uh, on news. They only talk about sensational stuff or their views or whatever, right? But you have to see what's under the hood, what's driving, what's causing what, and so that we can predict. Uh, you know, we can predict what's going to happen and position ourselves to take advantage on what's going to come our way. So yeah, the best way is to go to my website at striker s t r y k e r properties dot com, all one word. And then you can send them my uh, newsletter or you can drop me an email at Venkat, V as in Victor, E-N-K-A-T at Striker Prop, S-T-R-Y-K-E-R-P-R-O-P.com. I condensed properties into prop. So it's strikerprop.com. That's the email domain. Striker Properties is the website. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing. It's fun to see all the kind of different places you've dipped your toes in the water over the years all that you've learned and you're still continuing to iterate and get better and better and and uh, provide better investments for your investors and grow your portfolio so best of luck to you in the future and thank you so much for coming on the show perfect thank you